uh, the book of First Thessalonians tonight. So we, I think this is third or fourth week we've been on it, but uh, we're going to wrap it up. The, I titled this Day of the Lord. We're going to get into what this Day of the Lord is, and this is probably not a good image because this almost, this, this looks like something, a wow, like awesome, like Jesus is coming. It should probably look something like this because when he comes, it's not going to be wow, awesome. It probably should maybe even look something like this because he came the first time as a suffering servant to die for the world. The second time he's coming to wreck shop. He's the avenger of blood who's bringing pain and destruction and avenging the world who's rejected him. So you don't want to be here when he comes. You want to be coming with him, right? If you're still on the earth when he comes, that's not good. You want to be coming with him. We want to be coming with him. So when we say the day of the Lord, yes, Jesus is returning. No, no, no. You want to be what we talked about in chapter four, caught up in the clouds and with him, marriage, supper, the lamb, on stuff, and then we return on the day of Armageddon. So that's kind of what this chapter five is. Hope you got a chance to read it. We're going to kind of go through it if not. But uh, here's the wrap up. The first, that's, it's the first of the New Testament epistles. So it's it's kind of, it kickstarted all the New Testament documents. And uh, here's what we got. First and second Thessalonians were the only letters that Paul wrote on his second missionary journey. Remember, he uh, has this incredible, the recap of Paul's career. He's basically a bounty hunter hunting down the church. He's the enemy of the church. He's persecuting the church. He's trying to stamp out this crazy movement called Christianity. He's going out on missions, dragging people out of homes. He's, He's the enemy of the church. And he's on his way to, uh, to Damascus and he's going to he's hunting down some more of these guys. He's got he's he grew up a Jew. He's in Judaism and Christianity is the enemy. And so he's uh, trying to stop this radical movement. So he uh, but on the way to Damascus, he encounters somebody by the name of Jesus, changes his life, changes his career. And uh, he's a convert. And from then on, he gets in with the um, the disciples. They send him on a missionary trip. He comes back, gives a report. We have this crazy Acts 15 event. Then they send him out on a second missionary. He hasn't written any letters yet. He goes on the second missionary journey, and he stops off in Thessalonica and then goes down to Corinth, and he writes the first one. First and second Thessalonians were written from Corinth. Uh, Galatians, Romans, Corinthians, these would be written when he's on his third missionary journey. And then later on, uh, Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians are during his first jail term. So he will, those are called the prison epistles. So that's kind of, so this is the first ones. Chapter one, we talked about, it's the salvation for a Gentile church. What you discover is Thessalonica, this, he started his church. It's a Gentile church. These were not Jews who came to Jesus. These are Gentiles. They listened to the message and they, uh, they were converted. And in chapter two, called it the greatest missionary manual ever written. Chapter three was all, we talked about the Christian walk. He's just, or what we refer to it as. Chapter four, we got into the harpazo, the the rapture, also known as the blessed hope. And then uh, chapter five is gonna be the second coming, AKA the day of the Lord. So that's what, this is the wrap up. This is the, the whole book right here. So day of the Lord, hashtag second coming. Following this word, the harpazo, we talked about last week, people say, oh, rapture's not in the Bible can't find rapture in the Bible, they're looking in the wrong Bible. Because it is in the Bible, it's in the Latin, it's the rapturo, in the Greek, it's the harpazo, and in the English, it's caught up, catching away, snatching away. Uh, But following this harpazo, following chapter four, there is this catching away, there will come upon the earth, the world, the darkest period of time ever known. So once the church is taken out, wherever you want to place that on the timeline, when the church is gone, and let's just look around. How bad is the world right now? Is there some evil in the world? Is there darkness in the world? Okay, there's two things in the world though, as bad as it is. You got the church, Christ believers all around the globe, and you have a spirit, the Holy Spirit, that is the restrainer of evil. At some point in time, the Holy Spirit is taken away and all the believers are taken away. What's the world gonna be like then? You don't wanna know. Total, total depravity, right? Let's just like, who let the dogs out kind of stuff. This is going to illustrate something called the day of the Lord. In the Old Testament, day of the Lord's house referred to in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is 
Jacob's other name is Israel. So the time of Israel's trouble, time of Jacob's trouble, that kind of gives you a sense of who's going to be persecuted during that period of time, Israel. Jesus calls it the great tribulation. So this is all talking about this period of time, post-church, post-Holy Spirit, when the world just goes into total darkness. Uh, how can we get ready for it? Well, we don't want to be here, number one. That's the first thing you do to be ready for it. So here we go. Verse one, chapter five. Now, brothers, your verse, your translation may say brethren. So keep in mind who he's talking to here. Brethren, brothers and sisters, church believers. About times and dates, we do not need to write to you. So this times and dates, because they're asking about the second coming, right? That's what this subject is. The times and dates. Notice it's plural. Times and dates. So it's not just one day. It's not just one time. There's multiple ones. And this is what Jesus said to his disciples in Acts 1 7 at the ascension. If you remember, when he's going up, he says, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set for his own authority. So there's events, right? There's, there's more than one here. Prophets. Let's talk about there have been guys throughout time that have predicted when this is going to happen, the second coming. They predicted it. And you can go back all the way from the time of Jesus on through or after him. Uh, they all, he's coming back now. He's coming back now. I'm going to spare you the first 1,800 years because it happened in the 1,100s. It happened in the 1,300s, 1,500s, 1,700s. These people that have predicted, they set dates, right? But I'll start with William Miller in 1843. He basically took Daniel chapter 9. If you remember when we studied Daniel, the 70 weeks of Daniel and then the 2300 days and all this stuff. And he did a felt formula and came up with 1843. Christ is going to return 1843. Then he was wrong. And so he set the date. Well, no, no, I was wrong. It was October 22nd, 1844. So he got it wrong. And um, let me just go through here. These guys, right? This, these are called Millerites. The seventh day Adventist movement came out of this whole movement right here where they believed that he was coming on October 22nd, 1844. Guess what? He didn't come. E.C. Wisenhoods, 88 reasons for 1988, why the rapture will be in 1988. This sold 4 million copies back then. Popular book. Uh, pretty expensive, too. I bet you can get it for really cheap right now. You know? Uh, Harold Camping, September 1994, predicted, man, Jesus is coming in 1994. That book probably could get it uh, for free. All right? What about the Y2K apocalypse? There was a lot of pastors that said December 31st is going to, they didn't say that Jesus is going to come on December 31st or, or that, but what it was going to do, the Y2K collapse of the economy is going to trigger in this tribulation period. That turned out to be just another day. The Mayan calendar, 2012, oh, the Mayan calendar, this is going to start it. People, there's pastors that talked about the 2012, Jesus is going to return. And what about all the YouTube prophets right now? They make predictions all the time. They set dates. You can go on there. So uh, some of them are very influential. You can watch it. It's compelling. How do you not get sucked into it? Because there's going to be more dates set, right? How do you, got, you know how do you not get sucked into it? The whole counsel of God. That means the whole Bible is going to confirm whether these guys are for real or not. You know how they used to, uh, if you were declared yourself a prophet? What happened if you predicted something and didn't come true? They kill you. You were, you were stoned to death. So you would prove yourself a prophet. I, God said this is going to happen. Okay, if it happens, great. You are a real prophet. But if it didn't happen, we're killing you. So that took care of that. Verse 2 says, For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief of the night. I'm sure you heard that before. Nobody knows it's going to come like a thief in the night. So this phrase, same analogy Jesus used in Matthew 24, 43. You know, but but uh, we got to talk about who we're going to get to the second. Who is it going to be a thief in the night to? Let's it's not it's not just everybody. Now, while people are saying peace and safety and notice right here, we've been talking to the brothers and the brethren. Suddenly there is a major pronoun shift in this verse. He's going to talk about not you brothers and brethren, but the people, they, them. Peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, not the brothers. Not the brethren, them, they, okay, will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. 
Okay, he's not talking to you, he's talking to them. In the first two verses, Paul is speaking to brothers, but now he is talking about them and they. So real key shift to that. He's also saying that there is no need for him to write to them about the times and seasons. Why? Because believers will have nothing to do with it. Important part. He's also talking about peace and safety. This is when people feel secure. You know, when we have cured all diseases and we've got a safe economy, when we feel safe and secure, that's when destruction will come upon them. But you brothers are not in darkness so that the day should surprise you like a thief. He's going to uh, get into, you know, are like who are not in darkness? The brothers, right? The brethren, that's another word for the believers, okay? You are not in darkness that it should overtake you because you are children of light. And that's what he's going to get to. He's going to start throughout this chapter contrasting the children of darkness and the children of light. Day of the Lord, the rapture ends the church age. There's an age of the church, and then that, it started at uh, Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and it has a starting point, it has an ending point. It's going to end during the rapture, and that will begin this day of the Lord. And this period of time begins with the great tribulation, goes through the millennial reign of Jesus here upon the earth. So we're talking about when the church is gone, this day of the Lord starts then all the way through Armageddon, his return, and the thousand-year millennial reign. So you can read Isaiah 12 and 13. It's a, if we had time, we would read that. That's a really good uh, passage there. This is a time when God steps into history and deals with the wickedness of mankind directly and forcefully in judgment. He's coming to judge and to establish his kingdom. Here you go. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So what he's talking about here is you're not going to be caught off guard. Does that mean you're going to know the very minute or the very hour? No, but we, get, we hear this twice that believers somehow are not going to be caught off guard. They may not know the exact day, but the world is going to, it's going to hit them like a thief in the night. And we've seen examples of this, right? Like, let's go back to some of God's judgments, some of his wraths. Let's take like, there's small wraths, there's big wraths. What about the flood that killed everybody on the planet but eight? That's a big one, right? Um, Noah preached for 120 years, but people feel safe and secure. They disregarded his preaching. Thankfully, eight people listened to him, you know, and eight people got onto the boat. They didn't know when the flood was going to happen, but they knew it was coming pretty soon, right? They didn't know the exact day or hour that that door was going to shut, but they had an idea. The world was caught off guard. Raindrop, what is that? Wow, okay, they were caught off guard. So that let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. That's interesting. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, put, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a, uh, as a helmet. This kind of gets into your whole armor of God thing. If you want to do a quick, cool study on your own, do a whole study on Ephesians 6, the armor of God. You could do a quarterly study just on each one of these. But here's the point of this. We're not to be watchmen on the wall to be watching. We're warriors. Think of a soldier guarding himself against a surprise attack. We should all be in the battle. So you got the helmet of salvation that goes around the head, the crown. You've got the breastplate of righteousness that protects your heart. The heart is what leads people astray. If the heart, I mean, honestly, it's, you got to look at what's in your heart. When you look at somebody, you're like, I don't understand that person. Kind of consider what their heart is. Shoes of preparation. The belt, knowing the truth. You got to tie yourself up with, with scripture, the belt. Uh, the sword. We're going to talk about this in a second, spirit and the word. That's the sword of the spirit. And then, of course, the shield is your faith and your attitude. So really cool study there. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. Here's a verse for you. But to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there is, you know, there are a lot of Bible teachers, a lot of guys I respect that truly believe the church will go through all of God's wrath. They go think they think it'll go through the tribulation. Uh, there's people at, I mean, you look at the fellowship, like some are pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, post-wrath, pre-wrath, like they're all over the board, but this is one of those verses you got to collect up. God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do they think it's going to go through the tribulation? Does anybody know? Any idea why they think that? I don't either. Wrath. Difference between 
persecution of the world and God's anger and wrath. You know, we get to separate. Will the church go through persecution? It's been going through it. More Christians were killed in the 20th century than 1900 years before then put together. So there's persecution, but we're talking about something different. This is God's anger and judgment. We are promised not to suffer his wrath. That's what this says. And just like if you go back to uh, Thessalonians chapter one, verse 10, wrath is used as this day of the Lord, which is what we're talking about in this. So here's the paradigm of salvation. He promised us salvation. We talked about this last week. It's past, present, and future. Salvation is vague. It's, it's, there's uh, three aspects to it. We're, there is separation from the penalty of sin. Sin is, comes with a punishment. That's your justification. There's also a separation from the power, the allure of it, what trips you up. That's the power of sin. That's your sanctification. And then there's a separation from the presence of it that we will get down the road. All these are different aspects, though, of salvation. So it's, it's kind of a vague term. I think I feel like this helps people kind of understand this whole complicated word called salvation. So the church, this translation, this rapture, this snatching away, whatever you refer to it, of the church at the beginning of the day of the Lord gives assurance to us believers that we will have no part in God's wrath during the great tribulation when God's wrath is brought upon a world that rejects Christ. Read Revelation 6, 15 through 17. These are all in your notes. You can kind of study that. Um, and you want to search the whole counsel of God for his wrath. Don't just take one verse. One verse theology, which means here's my one verse, and I'm going to base everything I know about God on that one verse. is not good. It's the whole counsel of God, a.k.a. the Bible. Also, think about Lot Sodomar. Here's, you know, the, if, you, if you study uh, Genesis, what is it, Genesis 19, the destruction, God's wrath coming upon a city. He sends his two angels down. There's a prerequisite before they can bring down hellfire and damnation upon it. What was the prerequisite? They told Lot this. Hey, you and your family, you got to get out. We can't destroy the city until you guys are out. That's a prerequisite. So we're bringing the wrath of God down the city but you have to be taken out. Kind of like Noah, the wrath is coming upon this planet until you build the boat and get in the boat. I can't flood the world. So this is, you see this all throughout scripture. Daniel, uh, Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah had been predicting that, uh, well, not Daniel had predicted it, but uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, that Babylon's going to come burn Jerusalem to the ground. Daniel gets taken out first. So we see examples all through. Question, would a groom beat the heck out of his fiance before the marriage supper. That's what you're saying. If the church will go through tribulation, we are the bride of Christ. He is coming to collect our, the bride, right? Coming to collect the bride, going to the marriage supper. Would a, would the guy pound and beat his wife prior to the wedding? I don't think so. Probably wouldn't be his wife anyway. So, so this, this is what you're asking as far as like, if you think Jesus is going to, like persecute his bride before the marriage. Doesn't make sense to me. Verse 10, he died for us so that whether we are weak or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. So this therefore, what this means, this connects everything he's talked about into about what he's about to say. And what he's about to say is he's going to give, how many commandments did Moses give? Or God give to Moses? 10. Paul's going to give you 22 commandments, 22 commandments. And these are all higher level than the 10 commandments. These are the 10 commandments. Plus, uh, here's the 10 commandments, 22 commandments come up, encourage one another. We are called to encourage one another. We're called to build each other up. We are not to leave this to pastors and those in full-time ministry. It's your job to build up each other. That's your job. Well, that's, the, the uh, brother so-and-so can do that or pastor so-and-so. No, no, no. That's your job. Build each other up. Now we ask you brothers to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. We're, we're, we're to know and recognize the people that are working hard in the name of the Lord. We should recognize and lift, lift them up. It means you need to brag on them a little bit. That's the edification there. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of the work, live in peace with each other. Here, there you go. Hold them in the house, lift them up. And also no church can thrive when it is at odds with itself. So you got to live in peace. I mean, 
church about six blocks away uh, is no longer intact because church division. They had to close the doors. It happens. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle. Encourage the timid. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. So we've got to warn those who are falling into habits. This is the people in this room and your other and your family and uh, the whole body of Christ. You got to warn those who are falling and are being careless in their walk. And this happens. It happens with me. It might even happen with you. Comfort the faint of heart. Help the weak. I think those are just self-explanatory. Be patient with everyone. And that is a, uh, that's probably a challenging verse right there. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. There is no getting even with someone in God's program. You don't get back at someone. It's not getting even. So these, these are the 10 commandments at a higher level. This is a higher level than just don't lie, don't steal. And uh, the Christian life is made up of doing good and suffering evil. Doing good and suffering the hardships. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks. Well, let's do this right. Be joyful always. Uh, in your translation, it may be rejoice evermore. Here you have it. The shortest verse in the entire Bible. Just two little Greek words. And you might be thinking, wait a minute. I thought it was Jesus wept. Actually, Jesus wept is three Greek words. This is only two Greek words. So next time you're having a conversation with someone, you tell them like, this is, this is actually the shortest, in the English translation, it is, but uh, in the original, this is the shortest verse. First Thessalonians 5.16 uh, is actually three Greek words. You can <clears throat> jot that down for your, I don't know what you do with that, but uh, there's some, a little trivia for it. Rejoicing, living in the will of God and trusting in the Lord. Rejoicing, right? Think about David's prayer in Psalm 51 after he had an adulterous affair with uh, Delilah. And, you know, his, her, Delilah. the babe, not Delilah, Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Yeah, I get them all mixed up there. Some woman. <laughs> so, did I tell you that I got to see that if you I went to, I don't know if y'all saw this, you see uh, David's palace, you see where the swimming pool was. You got a chance to go over and kind of see right where, look down upon it. Yep. But he goes and, uh, uh, what does he say? Restore to me the joy of my salvation. That, that's the prayer. So a Christian sadness is always a lack of trust in God's power and his plan. When you are down in the dumps and you're depressed, your depression is, uh, is honestly, it's a test of our faith, right? Pray continually. This is the 13th commandment here. Paul constantly, by, Paul, he will always interject prayers into his letters. He'll find a way to pray even within the letters he writes. He was adding that into the middle of it. It is the church's obligation, responsibility to intercede for each other. Did you know that? It's not professional ministers. It's our job. It's our obligation to intercede and in prayer for our fellow brothers and sisters. And it's not limited by time or space, right? If you are not in a right place to pray, you are not in the right place. Yeah. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all, sir. That's all circumstances. Not just the ones that make you happy. This might be when you are not happy. Give thanks, right? How hard is that? Think Romans 8, 28. For all things work together for who? Who does all things work together good for? There. The, if, if you love God, right? If you love the Lord, all things work together for your good. To him who loved the Lord. Now. That's not to say that all things work together good for people who don't love the Lord. It says for those who love the Lord. If you love the Lord, all things work together for your good. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. It's also probably in translation, quench not the Spirit, right? So this is this, uh, is this word, Greek word, meaning extinguishing. Quenching is basically just saying no to God. That's what that is. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. And uh, be ready to recognize the messages of God when his servants speak. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Uh, man, we need to, I mean, there you go, self-explanatory. And avoid every kind of evil. Abstain from all appearances of evil. It's how it's translated in some. Also abstain from every form of evil. And uh, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless. Um, all the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctified, to be set apart. We talked about that last week, to consecrate. 
doesn't mean the absolute destruction of all sin in your body. How do you become sanctified holy? Because that's how it's worded in some of it. Sanctify through and through or holy. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you holy. How can you become sanctified holy? Well, you need to read your scripture holy. And that's a great question. Are you, are you reading, should be, the whole Bible through, or do you just read your favorite parts? we got to read the whole Bible. That's part of the mission of Bible Boot Camp is to go through the entire Bible. Not just our favorite books, but all of them, all 66 books. I highly encourage you to get some kind of reading plan. I didn't, uh, um, until 2002, I'd never read the whole Bible. Really had read very little of it. And 2002, I felt convicted. I said, all right, I'm going to try to read this book through. Had no plan. I started with Genesis 1-1, and it took, me for, it took me two and a half years to go through it. It just did. I mean, it's like I struggled with some of it, and each day I tried to get up and read a page or two. No formal plan. I just did that. In 2005, I finished it, and I thought, okay, well, I've done it. And it was probably 13 years later that um, I, had, I had a really great 2016, good year. I had an awful 2017. It was one of the worst years of my life. And out of that came 2018, where I had a renewed kind of interest in learning about the Bible. And I, um, I found a plan that was to how, how to read the Bible through chronologically. Part of it was I'd start reading it from Genesis on. It just I got bogged down in Leviticus, and some of those just didn't make sense to me. And I found a chronological reading plan where it read it in story form all the way through. And I, I said, I'm going to um, I'm going to try to read the Bible through each year of my life. If I'm alive for the next 30 years, I've read it 30 times. So um, so I started. Matter of fact, tomorrow will be uh, I do it every, May 4th every year. Is May 3rd today? May 3rd today. May 3rd. So May 4th, I'll start it again tomorrow. So anybody wants to jump in, uh, look me up on the old Bible app, you version, and uh, you can jump in with me. We'll read the Bible for the next year. Spirit, uh, may your whole speech, going to talk about the word spirit, which is uh, air, breath, wind. We'll talk about in a second, soul and body. But let's look at these three things right here. Your spirit, your soul, and your body. What is the difference between those things? Kind of hard to separate, right? It's easy to figure out what the body is. But what is your spirit and what is your soul? Interesting. So these two things right here is, uh, is, is, the, is the difficult part. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and to the joints of marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This right here is the reason, and by the way, um, soul is the Greek word psyche. It's where we get psychology psychologists and psychiatrists they're always limited they can they always run into a brick wall because they can't account for sin issues that happen with us is the decline of mankind it's the deterioration of sin and so psychologists cannot get all the way to the root of the problem because they can't get the sin they can't deal with that and uh it says the word of god can separate even your spirit and your soul which we're going to look at in a second i was looking for um I don't see my backpack, so I don't have a great object lesson here. I wanted to bring a, um, a flash drive, okay, and make, make some sense of this right here. Uh, does anybody happen to have a flash drive on you? No? You don't carry it around? All right. Everybody know what a flash drive looks like, though, right? How much does a flash drive weigh? It's about 0.7 tenths of an ounce, okay? So if I take a flash drive and I put it on a scale, it weighs 7 tenths of an ounce, if I take that flash drive and I fill it up with videos and documents and files and I load up 300 gigs of information on that flash drive, I fill it up, put it back on the scale. How much does it weigh? Same thing. It hasn't gained one tenth of an ounce. Why? Because the software, what's inside the flash drive, what's inside the plastic case has no weight, has no mass. So when I look at you. I see your hardware, not your software. Your body weighs something. Now, it may weigh more than what you would like it to weigh, but your spirit and soul what's in you has no weight. I can take that flash drive with all the files and documents. I can send it through the air and it has no weight. I can send it, you know, theoretically throughout time, just like you can. Your spirit and soul has no mass and that way it's not bound by time. So that's the two things between hardware and software. What about this right here? Apparently, when you separate the soul from the body, that's your spiritual death. But when you separate the spirit and soul, that is spiritual death. There's going to be a spiritual death for people who are 
not believers, and they will encounter something different than just the body dying. They're going to, uh, uh, some type of spiritual death there is going to be tough. He that is born twice dies once. He that is born once dies twice. What you want to do is be born twice. That's the goal. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Uh, basically what God finishes, what he starts, he finishes. And uh, brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Read this to the whole church. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And that line right there, that is Paul's unique trademark that he used. Grace. He's the only one that used grace. I think Peter copied it from him later on. But for the most part, that was his kind of his signature right there. So.